geography uh, and the environment. Uh, I'm Gillian Rose, uh, I'm head of the school, uh, and I'm really delighted uh, to welcome you all to uh, the first of what's going to be a termly series of open seminars in the school, where we're going to try and raise and explore and discuss issues that are of interest, hopefully, <laughs> concern to uh, all members of the school, whether that's students, uh, academics, uh, our professional support staff, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, this uh, seminar today has been arranged by our Equality and Diversity Committee in collaboration with Uncomfortable Oxford. And we've got two of the founders of Uncomfortable Oxford here, uh, Paolo and, and Olivia. If you haven't heard of Uncomfortable Oxford, please do go explore their website. Um, they're a fantastic organisation, I think, and they're doing really important work as part of what I'm sure you'd be the first to say is a much wider movement that's been gaining ground over the past few years across the university sector. Uh, that's really trying to uh, acknowledge uh, and explore some of the topics and issues that we tend to overlook when we think about the histories of the, of the, of the university as an institution. You know, things like where did their money actually come from? Where does it <coughs> come from? Uh, in what ways might that continue to shape what we teach, who we teach, what we think our mission is in, in the world? Uh, and I'm really uh, very pleased that geography is also starting to think about what kind of uh, similar sorts of questions in terms of the geographies of the university. You know, what kind of relationships do we have uh, uh, with uh, other researchers, other constituencies across the world? Um, and also, uh, you know, in terms of the physical fabric uh, uh, of the, of the uh, university, how do particular buildings, uh, statues indeed, sort of mark certain kinds of histories and neglect and undermine others? And I'm sure many of you will know about the Rhodes Must Fall movement, which started off in the University of Cape Town campus in 2015, uh, centred around um, uh, a statue of, of Cecil Rhodes. So uh, this is why we're here today, to start off what I hope will be an ongoing conversation and discussion in the Halford Mackinder Lecture Theatre. Uh, we have the Halford Mackinder professor sitting in the middle of the, uh, yeah, Halford Mackinder as a kind of, I was going to say a heavy hand in the department, it's not personal, it's just the label uh, that, that you moved into. Uh, and we are really honoured, I think, to have um, uh, Jerry Kearns uh, come here to tell us more about Mackinder and perhaps to speculate a little bit on current legacies uh, and current uh, consequences uh, of, of Mackinder. Uh, Jerry is Professor uh, of Geography at Maynooth. University. He's a, he's a very distinguished historical, political, medical, cultural uh, geographer. Um, he's published very widely, but I think of most relevance uh, to us today, and I'm, I'm sure you know, many of you in the room will be familiar with this. In 2009, he published a book called Geopolitics and Empire, uh, The Legacy of Health and the Kinder. So Jerry will talk, I think, for 35, 40 minutes. We'll then have some time for questions. We do have to leave this room by two, I'm afraid, because another lecture is taking place then. But we have a reception afterwards, which I hope that many of you will, will come along and join us to carry on to carry on the conversation. So uh, thank you, thank you, Jerry. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to talk about the intersection between two sets of things um, as the context we're talking about Mackinder. And the two sets of things, in a sense, it's almost like an algebra thing. We could say that, uh, for our purposes, decolonizing geographical thought equals memory work plus denazification. <laughs> and, and I want to talk about um, both memory work and denazification. In a sense, <coughs> memory work is broader. Denazification is a, is a particular type of memory work that, that had serious implications for, in, for, for intellectual thought and the legacies of particular thinkers. So memory work... Um, really, the word comes from uh, German use, really, something that, 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 that German people um, were required to do and um, accepted that they, that, they, that they should do after the Second World War. Uh, noticeable that stopping doing memory work is actually one of the primary claims of the alternative for Deutschland um, uh, right-wing party in Germany at the moment, so it's campaigning, you know, let the dead bury the dead, memory work's over. <laughs> But memory work, I think, has two, um, uh, two dimensions. One is, in, in a sense, the memory work that is incidental. It's not deliberate. It, it happens. Um, and then the other is purposive. And memory work can also both erase and supplement um, the past in, some, in, in, in certain ways. So let me just illustrate these very quickly for you. 
Uh, here is, um, in a sense, um, ignoring, right, ignoring the, the past and um, the legacies of slavery. Britain really hasn't begun to talk about its colonial history. It really hasn't. Um, uh, you know, I speak as someone who's just flown over from Ireland and has watched a Brexit debate uh, with uh, something between horror and disgust um, and the treatment of Ireland within, within, within that debate. But one of the things that, that, that uh, has been ignored is, it, until very recently uh, is, the, is the legacy of slavery um, uh, in, in Britain and Ireland. And here on, on the, on the left-hand side, I've just taken from that you know, uh, brilliant uh, public resource the the reparations uh, materials that uh, uh, historians have now have now put online when, when slavery was ended um, people uh, compensation was paid not to not to the slaves um, but to the slave owners um, and um, people uh, said well I have this many slaves and so on and, and, and um, more, more was spent on, on slave reparations that was, that was spent fighting the Crimean war for example it was massive expenditure I think the debt to cover that expenditure was only finally paid off a decade or so ago um, but I just plotted it for Ireland. To, to, to Irish people don't think that they are implicated in, in, in slavery. They see themselves as the victims of colonialism. And yet, many Irish people both owned slaves and claimed compensation for them. Um, the number of slaves that were owned by a family in the town of Larn was larger than the total workforce in the town of Larn. So the town of Larn was deriving more wealth from coerced black labour than from free white labour. Um, Second, deflate. Uh, very nice essay by Fintan O'Toole, um, a brilliant journalist. We've got uh, one of the best public intellectuals in the English-speaking world writing in Ireland, um, sometimes in The Guardian, but you know, read him every week in the Irish Times. He's, writ he's written a paper called um, Green Letterboxes. <coughs> this, this is, in a sense, a form of deflation. You know, it's, it, it's, 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 a, it's somewhere between defacing and covering. You know, the, um, so, on the, on the left is an Irish letterbox box with you know, Irish script, post and, 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 and uh, 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 telecoms, whatever. And then on the right is a, an inherited letterbox. And there's no attempt to scratch off the VR, but just painting the letterbox is a way of engaging with that history and as it were, placing the colonial uh, authority under some sort of erasure. Removing. Yeah, the removal of statues, the renaming of things. This is a statue of, of King William. Uh, obviously, um, not popular in Ireland after after 1922. But even before then, it had been it had been um, seriously defaced every 12th of July. Um, the uh, testicles on the horse were painted green. It's a, a tradition of, of of some sort. But this statue was 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 removed. I mean, other other statues were. Um, the, the statue of Victoria at, at Cork University was actually buried. They, they dug a hole in the quadrangle uh, where the statue was and put it in the hole, and, 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 and it only came out um, a few years ago. Commemorate, you know, actual deliberate policy of of supplementing uh, some some historical element uh, so that it so that it has a, a stronger resonance in the present. Top left is, is, is New Grange as it appeared in the late 18th century, and the bottom left is as it appears now. So it's been cleaned off and um, uh, made much more visible in the landscape and is used for um, uh, um, forms of commemoration and forms of spiritual practice around the solstice and so on. So again, you know, this, this is an active engagement with, 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 with the past. So that's the first thing, that these kinds of memory work, this, this erasure or supplementing the past in either a, a, um, um, a deliberate or, a, or, a, or a, um, a, a more lazy way. But for, for intellectual work, we really do need to study the history and the, and, and the um, a content of, of, of denazification. After the war, um, the uh, occupying authorities in, in, in Germany instituted the policy of denazification, which was the removal of Nazi emblems, but it was also an attempt to, rem or, or was stated as an attempt to remove Nazi influence within public life more broadly. Um, and this, uh, um, German people obviously weren't consulted on, on, how, on how their streets were renamed, but um, uh, here we have um, uh, Roosevelt Boulevard in, 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 in Krefeld. There were several hundred Adolf Hitlerstrasses that were that were that were renamed. 
But this is the element that, that, that we should really think about um, as, as intellectuals, and that is an attempt to uh, remove fascist influence in public intellectual life. And that means you have to name it. You have to name what the fascist influence is. We haven't really named what the colonial influence is in, 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 in British intellectual life. Um, and I just want to focus on these three terms, because in a sense, intellectually, of the two people I'm going to mention very quickly before I get on to the kinder, they, they, they essentially conflated two of these terms. So Hitler, you know, the, the whole fascist policy was to conflate all three. I'm one people, um, one, one state, as it were, one leader. Martin Heidegger effectively conflated these two, and um, uh, 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 Schmidt effectively uh, uh, con conflated, conflated these two. And the point about Heidegger and, and, and Schmidt is not that they were both members of the Nazi party, which they were, they both joined on the same day, um, not that they were both prominent advocates of uh, fascist policy, which they were, in their universities and in society more generally, but the more difficult thing is to say their thought prepared the way for this sort of society. Their thought prepared the way for this sort of society. So denazification means naming the preparation for Ein Reich, Ein Volk, and Ein Reich, Ein Führer. So when, when Heidegger writes about um, uh, German as a language which only like Greek can carry the highest spiritual forms of humanity, that sort of national chauvinism, that, that, that national cultural chauvinism is a, is, a, is a kind of spiritual racism. That prepares the way for. When Schmidt says that the most effective form of government is to rule through the exception, to suspend the legislative, and to rule directly through the executive, that's a preparation for Einreich, Ein Führer. That's naming the fascist preparation. We haven't done that with British intellectual thought more broadly. And when we start doing that, Mackinder will be part of the story. If we had time, I would, I would, I would, I would defend these things in a, in, 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 in a bit more detail, but I'm happy to in discussion. So, decolonizing the mind, a term which I take particularly from uh, Native American thought, we can begin to think about what, what's involved in decolonizing geographical thought by thinking about the examples that I, I mentioned of memory work and denazification and thinking about the kinder in the context of, of, of those two. Um, I'll skip this as well. Um, you all know this story, and I'll, and I'll get to I'll get to McKinder because we don't have, we don't have very much time. So, McKinder, geographer, um, still widely cited, and in my uh, uh, sort of way of summarising things as algebra, <laughs> give you two two more uh, pieces of algebra. First on the left hand side there, legacy or prestige equals influence plus echo plus citation. Influence is, is, is the people thinking things as a consequence of engaging with the work of somebody. All right? That's influence. So Marxist political economy you know, is influenced by the writings of Marx. Echo is when the same sort of idea is around. Like a wheel is around, you know. Uh, there are echoes of the way people talk about things, because that way of talking about it has such resonance with um, social structures or, or whatever. So there are echoes of Mackinder to be found in works where the people in question didn't actually read Mackinder. You know? And then the third thing is citation. Now citation is a, is a particular way of reinforcing the prestige of somebody. So when one names a lecture theatre after somebody, one is reinforcing the prestige by saying, hey, pay attention to this name. This is the sort of name that an educational space is glorified by wearing. You know? Be proud of your badge. That's citation. So the, the, all three of those are relevant in the case of Kinder, and I try to separate out the first two in, in my book, and I'm going to try and uh, give you reasons to think about the third one today. 
The second um, algebraic summary um, I, put, I have here is that behavior equals context plus choices. And choices involve um, stating what, what alternatives are available. If there's no alternative, it isn't a choice. Uh, and the form of a choice is often in the form of a priority. It's this over that. Okay? And I think that when we think about whether we want to lend prestige, when we think about whether we want to glorify our intellectual spaces, we should be thinking not about context. In other words, it's not, it's not enough to say that all Britain was colonial, and therefore anybody from that period is so tainted that they're all the same. In fact, that sort of use of contextual explanation ends up forgiving too much. You know? Well, he was a person of his time. They're all like that. They weren't. So when we're focusing upon making judgments about people, we should really be focusing upon the choices that they made, the alternatives that they were to the choices that they made, and the priorities that their behaviour expressed and pursued. So contextual work is important because in a sense it limits the amount of culpability we can attribute and limits the amount of praise we can give. All right? It's the supplement to context that is actually important for us. So I'm now going to take four elements of Mackinder's work and I'm going to try and, 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 and think through a little bit this notion of context as establishing one thing but then the important thing being to move beyond that and think about um, alternatives and priorities and choices. And that's, that's, that's why um, this book was structured in the way that it, that it is. After some biographical uh, bits about how an imperial subject or an imperial subjectivity was formed, each of the subsequent uh, uh, chap chapters takes a, 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 an important aspect of Mackinder's work and finds a contemporary who treated that theme or behaved in that context in a very different way. So that the difference between these two contemporaries is an element towards establishing the culpability of Mackinder, is an element towards thinking about what is the difference that is Mackinder. If you don't do that, you end up, as I say, using context as a way of, of getting people off the hook. Yeah? They were all X's or Y's or Z's. But they were X's or Y's or Z's in different ways. And in, if that difference is interesting, then that becomes the basis of making a judgment. And these are the four um, topics um, that I'm going to uh, say a little bit about. Um, exploration. You know, surely all geography had elements of exploration. It was, you know, travel tales, blah, 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 you know. What's so special about, about um, the way that Kinder did this? Biologizing social relations, you know, the, um, the intellectual force of Darwinism was extremely strong. You know, Darwinism um, had, in a sense, questioned you know, the fu most fundamental belief systems of, of a Christian nation, in a sense. It, it, it had um, taken um, uh, the literal truth of the Bible away. You know, so, so it really... Uh, it, it, it caused a, a, a serious um, uh, crisis of faith, a serious crisis of, 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 of identity, and, and, and from that gained massive prestige. So speaking in the language of Darwinian biology was almost unavoidable if you wanted to be intellectually credible. But that language could be spoken in different ways. <coughs> and those differences are really significant for thinking about the prestige and the glory that you bring to this intellectual space by adopting that name. Third, colonial historical geography. Um, Mackinder, uh, he, he was um, uh, a lecturer, a reader, uh, then you know, his professor, he was uh, for a time a uh, uh, head of of Reading Extension College, became Reading University. He was also for a time the, the director of the London School of, the School of Economics. He was also a member of Parliament. Um, he was um, uh, uh, 
British High Commissioner to South Russia uh, during the uh, uh, during one of uh, one of the early attempts to to undo the Bolshevik uh, seizure seizure of power. I mean, this was a, this was a prominent person in public debate and prominent person in 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 in, in, uh, in British intellectual life. But most of his writings were um, aimed at school children. He wrote two books, really, for academic audiences, Britain and the British Seas and the Rhine. He wrote um, one book for a sort of popular, as a popular political intervention, Democratic Ideals and Reality. But almost everything else was a series of textbooks for schools. And the message of those textbooks was, you are an imperial school child. It's all about the empire. <coughs> Geography was what would teach kids to be imperialists. So how he treats colonialism in those textbooks is extremely important. And again, I want to suggest that there were alternatives uh, uh, to that thought uh, at, at, at the time. And then finally, geopolitics or geostrategy. Um, uh, I want, to put, I want to situate Mackinder's particular um, um, treatment of um, the intersection of power and space in geostrategy and geopolitics, again, in the context of what people at the time, uh, other people at the time, said and did. So in this way, I hope, I hope that to rescue Mackinder from being treated simply as a symptom, <coughs> he's actually an individual, um, and we can, we can and should make judgments about him as an individual and not just as an emblem of an age. Okay. Okay. Exploration. The new geography. Um, I don't know how many new geographies there have been? Um, <laughs> there was one in the in the um, uh, in, in the late in the late nineteenth century. So, in the eighteen eighties or so, um, the prestige of people who came back from Africa. Up, up. You know, it, um, they put their pith helmet down on the lectern and um, show slides of um, um, semi-naked people of colour uh, and then talk about how dangerous it had been and um, so on and so forth and how they had discovered the source of some river or they definitively established in which direction certain mountain ranges went or whatever. Um, there, was a, there was a sense of crisis around this in the 1880s. People said, well, where are they going to go next? You know, they climbed the tallest this in that. They, they found the source of the longest here and there. You know? Now it will be the source of the tributary of. You know, now we'll be climbing the third highest. But it will be the third highest in this particular small region. You know? Next it will be Snowden or something. I mean, goodness me. You know, this, you know, what's left? What's left? So geography as a, as a sort of uh, public entertainment, and people would come out and, um, and, 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 and hear, you know, uh, Stanley, you know, Henry Stanley coming back and uh, <coughs> telling you, uh, well actually telling all the people he's shot to be, out, to be honest, um, they come out and hear Livingston, you know, you know, in the same way as they come and hear Dickens, right? they would come out for these, and so uh, the Royal Geographical Society was, was, was part of, of London's, um, um, the, the social life of, of, of the middle classes, not the middle classes in, in London. So go down, go down to uh, uh, Kings, Kensington for a bit of gore. Um, uh, and they, uh, they would go down to the Royal Geographical Society and, and, and hear these tales. The geographers were you know, beginning, beginning to think, well, this... We might be a busted flush now, you know. <laughs> why, why is anybody going to pay any attention to us when there's, when there's nothing, there's no, there's no superlatives, you know. All right, maybe we get to the North Pole, you know? get to the East Pole, whatever, you know. What then? And Galton, uh, the, the, uh, the eugenicist, um, gave a lecture to the uh, British Association for the Advancement of Science, and he named this crisis. He said, it's time for geography to move on from, from being um, uh, a science of collection to being a science of synthesis. You've got all this data, like GIS people, you know, got all this data, are you going to do anything with it? Of course, the answer is, ask me another one. This is where the new geography came from. The new geography would be the science of correlation, really, that we would, we would you know, follow 
um, uh, Darwinian environmentalism, and we followed which to the point where we could say, geography is not about stories of reaching the North Pole. Geography is about telling you why um, you are the finest people who ever lived, because of your environment. And in country after country after country, <coughs> geographers started to tell people, you're just far enough north not to be tropical, and you're just far enough south not to be antarctical. You're perfect. And that could be France, Germany, wherever. You know, we just, the golden mean is where we are. We are the only. And the British had this in spades, I'll, 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 I'll show in a minute. So the kinder gets drawn into this, this notion of a new geography, that geography is going to move on from, from uh, being essentially a catalog <coughs> into being an exploration. But with that went a loss of prestige. Because while thousands of people had come out to hear about shooting lions or, um, you know, they're not going to come out and hear about correlation. I've got a correlation for you. Hang on, hang on, I'll get to it in a minute. No, I mean, it was, geography was, it, was, it, was, was in danger of becoming scientifically respectable and socially dull. <laughs> Not here, of course. Yeah, I'm not sure. Geography here, um, scientifically dull and socially exact. I mean, uh, okay. So we had you, you, you had this notion that, that that maybe something was being what was being lost. Well, one of the things that was that, that, that was understood as being lost was masculinity, because it took a certain kind of man to face down a tiger. But doing a correlation, come on. Girls fight. And so they felt it as a form of emasculation. You know? And they, and they, they used all sorts of highly gendered language to talk about this emasculation. Somebody, uh, I think W.M. Davis was, was dismissed, uh, the, 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 the American geomorphologist was, was dismi dismissed uh, earlier geographers as having a, a butterfly catcher's mentality. <coughs> Or oh, butterfly, little net, you know? Very gendered way of talking about, about what is knowledge and how knowledge is gained. So in the kinder, you know, it's like you know, people say, you know, look at Picasso's early drawings, he really could draw if he wanted to. So to, to, to retain his masculinity, Mackinder, as the new geographer, the, pipe, the person who's putting out this synthesis, <coughs> He wanted to show he could be an old geographer too. He could be a real man. And so, he found the second highest peak in East Africa. The highest having already been climbed, Kilimanjaro, by a German. <laughs> and, in 1899, he took um, uh, a group of people to climb... Um, Mount Kenya. <coughs> now, remember I said we have to think about the alternatives, the choices, and the priorities. What was the priority here? The priority, number one priority, was for him to be on top of a mountain. A big one. The highest one that hasn't yet been on top of. And again, the language was gendered. He described it as a virgin peak. And in his diary he says, Kenya is a virgin no more. And he took the top of the, of the mountain home with him. So the, so the peak was actually diminished by his presence. And that bit of rock was on Gordon Clark's desk last time I was in this department. So, in Mansfield Grove, you may be in Gordon Clark's uh, uh, study at home or wherever, the, the, the geography department has the top of Mount Kenya. So your department actually diminished uh, uh, the second highest uh, uh, peak in, in, in East Africa. So that was his first priority. Okay, so he's shown off, he's been a man, he's, he's going to the top of this thing. But in terms of priorities, the fact that he was British was important. So this was all done in secret. Um, there was no public announcement that this is what he was going to do. Uh, he had a brother-in-law who was the local, the local high commissioner. Uh, the uh, photographer on the exhibition was um, uh, married to his wife's uh, sister. Or no, it was the uncle of his wife. Um, so this was a small family affair. The Royal Geographical Society gave a bit of money. Uh, they kept it all quiet. It was a relatively small group of Europeans, plus 90-odd um, uh, um, African 
uh, porters. Why do they need 90 odd African porters? Because, because he decided that he couldn't eat the local food. Now, the, an African porter could carry uh, more than two weeks' food for himself. But an African porter could only carry um, two days' food for a European. So you had to have lots and lots of these African porters because these Europeans ate biscuits, you know, keep the morale up, you know, and they can't bump up, bump up a mountain without, uh, you know, a hunting in Palmas or, or, or whatever. Or did these people want to carry these things? Well, actually, um, no, they didn't. Um, they were bought. They were paid, they were bought. How easy was it to get them? It wasn't easy at all. They had to go out with guns to buy these people. Because this area had a smallpox epidemic and a famine. A famine that had been created by the British in the previous two years because they had put a railway through this region. And to build the railway, they'd gone out and collected labour. And taken the food from the area to feed the workers who made the railway. So by the time the kinder comes in here, there's no, there's no food reserves. And people are wandering around looking for food. So a small pox epidemic is being spread. So his relative says to him, this area is going to be closed down. The kinder says, I'm out of here. Before the area gets closed down. So he makes the choice that getting into the top of this mountain is worth a hundred African people's time, and as I'll show in a minute, lives. Because these people are hungry. They can barely carry these boxes. How does he encourage them to carry these boxes? Well, every night he gets his gun out and he walks up and down and he shoots it. And if anybody throws a box away, they're whipped. Some of these people, Mackinder orders to be given 30 lashes before they have to carry on carrying his boxes. So that he can have his biscuits on his way up the mountain. When he finishes the climb, he comes down the mountain, and he doesn't go back with the African workers. He doesn't return the African workers to the company from whom he bought them. I mean, this is slavery. He doesn't return them. Because in the midst of his accounts, you can go to the, the, the Rose Library and read this. In the midst of his accounts, there are eight, there are ten Africans actually who are marked as dead. Two of them were um, uh, killed foraging for food. So local, uh, local African people killed these people to prevent them taking food back to the thing, right? Eight of them, eight, shot by orders. Now I've gone, through the, I've gone through the account of this thing, and there's only two times when we can't account for the names of all of the, of all of the Africans. One is... In the last phase of the, of, the, of, 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 the, of, the, of the of the walk back to returning the labour, but by that stage the, the Africans had already been fed. That bit was being led by Sanders, not by Mackinda. Mackinda had already run off to get back to Oxford. He said in time. So it's most likely that they ate a shot during the crisis point of the expedition, which is, which is when Mackinda is forcing them to stay close to the mountain so that he can have a, he can have a stab at being the man on the top. He's in charge at that point. Eight shot by orders. Is that just the way it was done at the time? Well, certainly Stanley killed African porters. But not everybody did. The year before this, uh, Gregory, J.W. <coughs> Gregory, had been trying to get up the mountain. And he faced difficulties, and so he just stopped and went back. You know? He didn't, he didn't risk the African lives for him having a picture of him on the top. And in my book I describe Mary Kingsley, who, 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 um, who climbs the uh, highest mountain in West Africa uh, at, at, at this, this time, and her attitude. She learned the local language. Mackinder didn't. Mackinder described the local language as a series of grunts. She says the thing she's most proud of is that she never struck or ordered to be struck any African man. 
Mackinder lists the whippings, the beatings, the threatenings. Okay. That's the choice. That's the priority. It's worth it to have Mackinder Valley. He also named an owl after himself. Wise owl. It's worth it to come back to the Royal Geographical Society, to come back to Kensington Gore, and to show this slide. Okay, biologizing and social relations. So now we're into the new geography. So the kinder showed he could do the old geography. He could do it all right. He was manly enough to shoot. Biologizing social relations, this Darwinian understanding of um, a society. I'll start with this, since we're Brexiting. Um, this is something called the Index of Negrescence, developed by um, a physical anthropologist, John Beddoe. And it's, the, it's basically the percentage dark hair minus the percentage light hair. And uh, later on it gets more sophisticated, they add in eye colouring too. Now Beddo says, it is well known, he says, that if you visit a prison, they've got dark hair. The map that this is all based on, that map in the middle from, from Beddoe's 1885 thing, you can barely read, the, read the, 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 the text to explain it up there, but it just says personal observation. So he looked at people and said, dark, very dark, blonde. So two plus one is three, minus one is two. So this is in percentage terms, so we're, um, we're two thirds, plus two thirds, four thirds, minus one third, uh, yeah, so I know, Nigel, 100% of whatever we've got here, you know, we'd have a really high, um, uh, um, an index that Ripley, when he, when he reproduced the same map, called an index of brunetteness. Alright, okay, that's sort of descriptive. McKinder reverts to the, in to, to the index of negresses. And he says, Ireland, the west of Ireland, <coughs> is the most negrescent part of the UK. And he says, he, 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 he cites Beddo and he, and, he, and he says, this is the blondest part of the UK is around London, the southeast plain. This is, right? And he says, these negrescent people in the West here are full of superstition, emotional. Blonde people rational. This is the racialising the, 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 the United Kingdom. McKinder's first political act was to campaign to prevent Irish independence. That was his first, that was first, his first political campaign. Stopping the Irish from being independent was really important for McKinder. He talked about Southeast England as a specific genus of the human species, John Bolt. <coughs> he said, for a thousand years, for a thousand years, there has been no immigration to Britain. The <coughs> same blood has been handed down generation <coughs> to generation for a thousand years. And this blood carries the English character. And he says, because of this, we must prevent immigration and miscegenation. <coughs> Was this inevitable? No. Kropotkin had a very different understanding of the biology of humanity. Kropotkin, who was invited to be a member of the Royal Geographical Society, said he could only join it if they would drop the R. Yeah? But they gave him medals and all the rest of it because he was intellectual. You know, uh... So Kropotkin didn't understand um, uh, race as, in a sense, the, the inheritor of these characteristics in this way. Kropotkin understood 
the social organism as, as having a biological purpose. And the biological purpose of, of sociability was mutual aid. So Kropotkin said, this is all about cooperation. You know? This is how you succeed. McKinder said, no, this is all about racial purity and competition between the races. Two very different readings of the application of Darwinian biology to society. So no, it's not inevitable that you should be a racist like Mackinder just because you're a Darwinian. Oops. Okay, colonialism. Sorry, I'm, I'm running, I'll, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit now. Colonialism in uh, India and Ireland. So in these textbooks that Mackinder writes about the empire and he's telling all these young people that they should be imperial. One of the things McKinder dislikes is, is people emigrating to the United States because they're leaving the empire. So in his text, with how do you talk about the United States? So the children talk about Canada and Australia and South Africa and Rhodesia, another place with a famous name on it. There are people who say, well, it's a mistake to rename. I mean, you know, <coughs> Rhodes, he was just a creature of his time. You know, he just said, that's what they're all like. Why should you? Don't get so uppity. Don't get, don't get so, so, so stressed about the fact that Rhodesia has the name of Rhodes. Don't get so stressed. After all, last year, I think it was 12 Rhodes Scholars, Mandela Rhodes Scholars came to Oxford, eight of them were people of colour. I'm quoting from a paper defending the, the continued use of Rhodes uh, on public things. McKinder does write about, about, about Ireland, he never, he never mentions the famine. When he writes about Ireland, he just writes about rebellion. When he writes about India, he writes about barbaric India. <laughs> He writes about them as exotic. He says, in India, there are people who, who for their religion, hold their hand in the, in the air, and, they, and it stays there for their whole lives. That's just not true. <laughs> it's in the textbook. So they're told how exotic, how freaky, and how barbaric these people are. And Mackinder says, if you go to India, which he never did, if you go to India, your heart will beat with pride because you'll know that 800 white men held a continent through their moral authority. Their example, their rationality. Your Oriental can't think straight. He says Oriental people are all sentiment. They don't believe in an external reality. This is being told to kids in school. <coughs> this isn't. Bodies strapped to cannons after the Sepoy Rebellion. These illustrations are from British newspapers. It was known. Rebels, sepoy rebels being hanged. It was known. Photographs circulated. It was known. So when Mackinder writes about India as a barbaric place of superstition and doesn't write about colonial violence, he's missing out something that was known. And if you read Reclus, Elise Reclus, probably I think the greatest geographer of the late 19th century, early 20th century, Elise Reclus, on colonialism, you get a completely different story. Reclus does write about the, the violence that's necessary to establish and maintain colonialism. Mackinder does not. It's a choice. Because he wants you lot to go out to the empire and fight to keep it. Okay, last one. Um... I don't know why I thought I could get through all of this <laughs> at, some point, at some point over the last week I thought it might I just want to say a little bit about, about Mackinder in South Russia and about, and, 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 and about, about geopolitics it's, there's one thing you know about Mackinder is probably the so called heartland theory really the, the, the story goes something, goes something like this Mackinder argued that in the west of Russia um, there was a basket of resources uh, wheat fields, coal 
uh, oil down into in, into into the into the Caspian uh, iron ore. There was there was a basket of resources that would be sufficient to sustain a world empire if they could only be developed. <coughs> and he says now with railways, the Russian um, the Russians can establish uh, a, a simple efficient polity across all this space and start to exploit these resources and build themselves up into the world's greatest. The world's greatest land power. So McKinder's argument was that the, 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 that there was an inevitable teleology of scale in in, um, in 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 spatial relations of society. That society goes from village to empire. And he says we're now entering the world of empires. So there's already a British Empire. The question is how many other empires will there be, and when these empires bump up against each other, which one uh, will prevail? And McKinder says it would be a really good thing for the world if the British Empire prevailed. Obviously. So the Russian Empire's got to fail. So he says that the main thing we have to do is we have to prevent the Russians organising the space as a single unit. Um, we have to uh, prevent the Russians getting a warm water part, port. We have to keep the bear in its cage. You know, very much, in a sense, building from the sort of grand strategy balance of power arguments of the 19th century. But acute Russophobia. Now, at the end of the First World War, uh, towards the end of the First World War, the Russians had dropped out of the war against the Germans after the Bolshevik <laughs> Revolution. Mackinder was horrified, as, as, were, as were the Brits generally. So they decided that regardless of Russia being um, a non-belligerent, they would attack Germany through Russia anyway. So they just said, you just happen to be between us and Germany. So although you're not a belligerent, we, we, so they, they, they had troops on, on Russian soil from 1917 to the end of the war. At the end of the war, Churchill is put in, in charge of demobilisation and he's told to bring back the troops from everywhere. He forgets to bring them back from Russia because he's got something else he wants them to do. He wants them to smash Bolsheviks. And Mackinder is sent to South Russia in December um, uh, 1919 to organise the white Russian um, uh, uh, polity to organise to organise an economy for the White Russian Army, so the White Russian Army can move up to Moscow and displace the Bolsheviks. So he's, he's appointed British High Commissioner to South Russia, and now he has an attempt. He has the opportunity to implement the the geographical ideas of the heartland and so on that he had drawn upon theoretically. You can read about this in the in the book, but this is how it ends up. These are the frozen bodies of white Russian soldiers who had been captured by the Bolsheviks um, and tortured. The white Russian army does not, does not prevail. Mackinder comes, comes back. Now again, you could say it was inevitable. That's just the way it was. They, were, they, they hated Russians. You know, everybody hated Russians. Everybody hated communism. Not, not everybody thought that it was worth putting these troops to do this. Not everybody thought that after a world war in which millions had died, you should continue fighting. In fact, there were very few who thought that. Mackinder, Curzon, Churchill. When this came up for discussion at the British cabinet, Balfour, the, 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 the Tory uh, politician, said, I'm fed up being told that the gateway to India is somewhere other than at the edge of India. They will say, we have to hold East Europe against the Bolsheviks, because that's the gateway to India. And Balfour is saying, this strategic thinking that everything is the gateway to India, a bit fluid, isn't it? And Lloyd George said to Churchill, if we commit to this war, millions will die, and it will cost millions in sterling. <coughs> and he says, I know you're willing to do that, but there's not a sane man alive who, who, who agrees with you. Well, the kinder agrees with you. <laughs> This is the person that we glorify. A person who believed that force was the basis of international relations. Who believed that race was the fundamental identity that counted. Who hated socialism. Who hated the working class. That, my friends, is Halford McKinder.